is made out of pencils of all sizes. He's a passionate collector, and these pencils will come from all over the world. He believes that joining different pencils together represents a message of peace, harmony, and an inclusive world. Asif has grand plans for the future, which includes making a house entirely out of pencils. That furniture, that chair is all completely made out of pencils. I hope he makes it into the Guinness Book. He deserves it, it looks like. Look at the, the work on that. It's just remarkable. All right, that's our time for now. Be careful if you're heading out there. Some of the streets are so kind of slippery. We'll see you back here tomorrow. News 3 at 5 is right now. And right now at 5, the man accused of killing another man at a casino parking lot is now in custody. We'll tell you what led to his arrest. The school district of Beloit did not cancel classes today, and some parents are upset why the district decided to stay open. President Trump says the State of the Union is canceled in his latest argument with Democrats over the partial government shutdown. This is News 3 at 5. Thanks for staying with News 3. A more than a week-long manhunt has now come to an end. Murderer Robert Pulvermacher was caught 10 days after police say he killed a man in a casino parking lot. Our Killy Arthur has the very latest. Snow seems like it's been getting in our way all day today, but in the case of finding convicted felon Robert Pulvermacher, it was pretty helpful. At around 1.30 this morning, a plow driver saw a person get dropped off around trucking company Pulvermacher Cartage on Madison's northeast side. The driver then called it in, reporting it suspicious. Officers went out there. They were able to locate um, some footprints in the snow and then followed those footprints and eventually located our suspect. Putting an end to a 10-day search for Robert Pulvermacher, who allegedly killed 88-year-old Harold Johnson in the parking lot of a Ho-Chunk Casino in Sauk County, all because Johnson owed him $100. Pulvermacher then went on the run after the incident January 13th. It puts a lot of people's mind to ease now. Multiple agencies, including Sauk County Sheriff's Department, Portage Police, and Madison Police, worked the case. But Sauk County Sheriff Chip Meister says the plow driver made all the difference here. The big lesson, if you see something, say something. People should do that and leave it up to, leave it up to uh, um, law enforcement to decide if that incident needs to be investigated when you call in. And um, obviously it did. And that's how we caught him. Pulvermacher Cartage is owned by Vern Pulvermacher, Robert's brother, who declined an interview. Johnson's family tells us, quote, we will all rest easier knowing he has been caught. I made contact with the family immediately to let them know, and they were very grateful. Pulvermacher will be in Sauk County Court tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. In Madison, Keeley Arthur, WISC News 3. Saw County Sheriff Chip Meister says there are no additional suspects. All right, it is the calm after the storm. Now let's get a look at your first alert weather. Meteorologist Dana Fulton joining us from the weather patio. Dana? It is calm outside right now. All is quiet. Even this morning as the snow is wrapping up, it was fairly quiet outside for us. And we're going to have a little bit of break before we have to talk about too much snowfall moving back into the area. Of course, we want to know how much actually came through. It's some prairie record or measuring close to nine inches in Janesville, close to eight and Madison at the airport officially 6.9. I know a few areas, including here at the station, we've picked up just a little over seven, but that's our official measurement for Madison. Let's take a little look at our Doppler track also with some storm reports. These are just reports in the last six hours of folks uh, measuring out the snow that they received in arena about nine inches in Monticello, close to 7.2 and in Reeseville, five and a half inches of snow falling for us. So a significant snow event sliding through uh, much of the state. Central and southern Wisconsin really seeing the bulk of that snowfall. For us right now, we have a calm scene on our Doppler track. The sky actually fairly calm for us, not expecting any flurries overnight. We may see a few tomorrow, uh, but I think that's really going to add on to what we've already received. It's close to 20 in Madison and in Lone Rock, but it feels a little closer to 11 in Lone Rock and 10 in Madison. So that wind chill definitely a factor for your evening. As we look ahead to tomorrow, plan on a cold day. Temps will barely be in the teens for afternoon highs. We'll start in the single digits, but that's just the start of it. We're really in a bitterly cold stretch for the end of the week. Friday and Saturday are both alert days because of the cold air that will be moving in, and we do have snow by the end of the weekend coming back into the area. We'll take a closer look, though, at those snowfall accumulation estimates right now and the wind chills for Friday and Saturday morning in just a few minutes. All right, Dana, thank you. A 20-year-old Janesville man is dead following a two-car crash on Highway 51 near 
Edgerton. The Rock County Sheriff's Office says shortly before 7 this morning, police responded to a two car crash on Highway 51. One driver died as a result. Officials say the driver of the other vehicle suffered a minor knee injury and was released at the scene. The crash remains under investigation, but deputies say poor winter road conditions were a contributing factor to the crash. And the ice and snow also caused a major crash this morning. Ten semi trucks involved in the crash causing a six hour shutdown of the interstate. Jamie Perez joins us live near Mauston on I-90 where the crash happened. Jamie. Right, well, one person was taken to the hospital as a result of that crash and that crash actually happened right here on this interstate which caused the interstate to be closed down for about six hours. Traffic was backed up all along this area. You can see that that is no longer the case. But like I said, it did take six hours to get it cleared up to that point. Now, State Patrol tells me the first crash started on westbound traffic when one semi rear ended another. They were carrying aluminum and metal pipes, so all of those spilled across the interstate. Eastbound traffic then slowed down when that happened, which caused another rear end collision. Then a semi going westbound saw the original crash, but was unable to stop on time, so they swerved across the median and crashed head on into another semi going in the opposite direction. So obviously a really big mess on the interstate, which caused both directions to close off. Traffic was rerouted from Linden Station to Lisbon before they were finally able to open up that interstate again around 2.30 this afternoon. They were able to open up a lane before then on the interstate and were able to move some of the jackknifed semi trucks off the roads or into the ditch area. State Patrol does say that the slippery road conditions were a big factor in this huge crash that happened. So this is just a friendly reminder that even though the snow isn't necessarily falling right now and there are still snow plows out on the road clearing the roads for us, it is still pretty dangerous out here. So just a friendly reminder to please be cautious while you are driving. Back to you. Jamie Perez live in Mauston. Jamie, thanks. And as many as of us have seen today, cleanup is underway tonight as city crews plow the snow-covered roads all over Madison. Rose Schmidt is live on the far west side of Madison to explain how you can help make their lives a little easier. Rose? Yes, well, there are still several roads in Madison that haven't been plowed yet or need to be plowed again. This one, Whitlock Road, is an example of that. I'm standing in several inches of snow here. And city officials say that one of the best things that you can do to make sure that you're helping out crews as they come to plow your streets is to try and park off the streets. And Whitlock Road is a good example of that as well. You can see no cars have parked all the way down here. And right now there are about 150 pieces of equipment out plowing the streets of Madison. So make sure that you can help them out by giving them room on the roads, areas with the most traffic and roads near hospitals are some of their top priorities. Plowing, of course, is a long, slow process. So remember, if your street hasn't been plowed yet, they're probably on their way. Make sure you're accounting for snow if you're heading anywhere tonight or tomorrow morning. Bake that into your commuting time. So whether you're on a bike or a car or whatever you're, however you're getting through the city today, I would expect to encounter some snow covered roads because the, um, it just takes a long time to do citywide plowing. We started doing it around 7 a.m. It's kind of when the operations kicked off. It takes about 14 to 16 hours to plow our city. The city's streets division say the two main challenges crews face today were the timing of that snowfall and the salt they put out on the road is working more slowly because temperatures are staying around the 20 degree mark. And of course, if, if there is an emergency tonight, please do not hesitate to call 911 and the 911 dispatch center will get in touch with the streets division and make sure that the emergency vehicles can get where they need to go and make sure streets like this one are plowed when they need to be. Takes a long, yeah, it takes a long time after a big snow like we just had. Rose Schmidt reporting live. Rose, thanks. The school district of Beloit is standing by its decision not to cancel school today. Parents upset at the decision took to social media this morning to express their frustration. Rock County reporter Adam Duxter joins us from our bureau at the Janesville Gazette with why district representatives feel they made the right decision. Adam? Well, it was a message that was frustrating for parents, students, and teachers alike that while neighboring districts like Janesville and Beloit Turner would have today off of school, the school district of Beloit would not. And multiple parents took to the district's Facebook page to express their concern, saying that the decision not to cancel school was wrong and dangerous. But the district is standing by its decision, saying there were several factors that played into the choice a high poverty district so for parents to miss work is a very tough situation that puts them in a tough situation um, and it also provides uh, kids with a safe place to go uh, it provides them with meals for the day 
Um, and then parents also do not have to make alternative uh, arrangements for child care. Investors explained to me that while the school districts of Janesville and Beloit Turner had the day off of school, that those districts are responsible for busing kids in from rural areas, something that the Beloit School District is not responsible for. And coming up at six, we'll hear from parents who were frustrated, the dis frustrated with the decision and ultimately made the choice to keep their kids out of school today. We will see you at six. Thanks, Adam. Meanwhile, people around Wisconsin are continuing to clear their driveways and dig out their vehicles after the big snow. Madisonians saw 6.9 inches of snow. Some residents say they had to shovel more than once. And I dig a little bit last night, but still was because it was snowing overnight. So that's why now I have to dig again. <laughs> And like Dana said earlier, we are not done with winter yet. She's forecasting more snow for Monday, and she'll have more on that in just a little bit. Be sure to stay informed about the weather 24-7 by downloading our Channel 3000 First Alert Weather and Traffic app. It is always free in the app store of your choice. A Madison man had to be treated for chemicals in his eyes after a mugger attacked him on the city's east side last night. Madison police say a 55-year-old man was outside <coughs> in Best Western on Anamark Drive. This was about 10-15 p.m. Police say while the man was outside, a stranger sprayed a chemical in his eyes, then hit him in the head with a canister. The victim told officers cash was taken from his pocket and the robber drove off in a red Dodge pickup truck. Madison Fire Department paramedics treated the injured man for exposure to what they believe was possibly pepper spray. The CEO of the YMCA of Northern Rock County has been put on administrative leave during an internal investigation. CEO Tom Denbor was put on administrative leave after the board of directors met last night. In a statement, the board said it's taking several steps to address concerns raised by YMCA members and the community. In December, Rock County residents signed a letter written to the board detailing concerns about a lack of transparency at the organization and within the board. The United Way Blackhawk Region said it denied the YMCA of Northern Rock County's 2019 to 2021 admission eligibility application. That cuts funding. YMCA operations are continuing without interruption during that investigation. The president's annual State of the Union address before a joint session of Congress is off for now, but this comes after a series of written back and forths between President Trump and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi after Speaker Pelosi told the president to postpone the speech until the government reopens. State of the Union speech has been uh, canceled by Nancy Pelosi because she doesn't want to hear the truth. Will do something in the alternative. We'll be talking to you about that. Government is still shut down. I still make the offer. Let's work on a mutually agreeable date, as the original date was mutually agreeable, uh, so that we can welcome in properly. What this comes as the Senate prepares to vote on dueling funding bills tomorrow. One of the bills will include the president's proposal to extend protections for DREAMers for three years in exchange for $5.7 billion for the border wall. The other measure would reopen the government through February 8th without new funding for the wall, but neither is expected to have the 60 votes needed to advance. South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Pete Buttigieg announces he's forming an exploratory committee to run for the Democratic president nomination. Buddha Judge has been dubbed the millennial mayor at just 37 years old. He's one of a few candidates under 50, one of uh, even a few under 40. If he were to win the Democratic nomination, Buddha Judge would be the first openly gay presidential nominee from a major political party. More to come on News 3 at 5. Up next, multiple people are dead after a shooting at a bank in Florida. We will have the very latest. And Phoenix police have made an arrest in the rape of a woman who was incapacitated at a long-term health facility. And on Wall Street, the Dow up more than 171 points. The NASDAQ and S&P 500 each add more than five. We'll be right back.
Police in Sebring, Florida confirmed five people are dead at a shooting at a bank. Authorities say the suspect called 911 a little later, a uh, little after 1230 to say that he fired shots inside the SunTrust Bank in Sebring. Police and deputies surrounded the bank and tried negotiating with the armed man. When efforts to make him come out didn't work, the Highlands County SWAT team went inside. The suspect then surrendered to the SWAT officers. Police have made an arrest in the rape of a woman who was severely severely incapacitated at a long-term health facility in Phoenix. 36-year-old Nathan Sutherland made his first court appearance today in connection with the rape of the woman who gave birth last month. Police say DNA linked Sutherland to the crime and the newborn. The 29-year-old victim, a member of the San Carlos Apache tribe, was incapacitated when she was three years old and had been at the facility for 26 years. She delivered a healthy baby boy December 29th, but the staff inside the clinic did not even know the patient was pregnant. Sutherland is a licensed practical nurse who was responsible for providing care to the victim during this time the sexual assault occurred. The defense asked for no more than $50,000 bond, but the judge went with the prosecutor's recommendation for a half million dollars bond. The suspect accused of kidnapping a 23-year-old Boston woman appeared in court this morning. 38-year-old Victor Pena cried in court before he was ordered to undergo a 20-day mental health evaluation. Pena is accused of kidnapping Olivia Ambrose Saturday night in Boston. Police tracked the two of them yesterday to an apartment complex following a high-tech search. His motive is still unknown, but according to the Boston Globe, transit police have twice kicked the 38-year-old out of the subway for menacing women. All right, we know some very chilly weather is coming our way after the snow that has fallen, turning this into an ice box. Dana Fulton on the backyard patio. Dana? It's certainly starting to feel like the inside of my deep freeze outside right now. It is cold and it is going to stay cold for us as we get towards Friday and Saturday. Our wind chills are going to drop quite a bit for the start of the day, so a bundle up, plan ahead for your Friday and Saturday commute. Looking at our Doppler track right now, it's actually fairly calm, a nice change of pace from what we were looking at 24 hours ago. That front now well to the east. It's continuing to push quite a bit of rain, though, towards the east coast. That next front off to the northwest may bring just a slight chance for flurries tomorrow, but not really focusing on the moisture associated with it, just the very cold air that will be plunging in for Friday and Saturday. Because it's going to be so cold outside, we have added alert days to the forecast for Friday and Saturday. Low temperatures Friday morning will be close to about 11 below zero with wind chills up to 35 below zero. Again, very cold outside. High temps only getting close to two degrees. Degrees. For Saturday, it'll feel like we are close to 30 below zero with the wind chills dropping for us. Even in the afternoon when we get high close to six, those wind chills still close to 10 below zero. So our future track here showing off those wind chills throughout the uh, Friday and Saturday span those 48 hours. It is going to stay very frigid outside throughout the entire state not just for southern Wisconsin. We're all included in this cold boat extending up into Minnesota as well and even into northern Illinois. That cold air again plunging in behind that cold front and then we see temps rebound just a little bit for Sunday, but not by much. We're expecting a cold stretch for next week as well and our next weather system moving in late Sunday and for Monday and that's going to bring some more snow if you aren't over it just yet. Uh, for Thursday plan on a variably cloudy sky. We'll start the day close to four. Throughout the afternoon, there is a slight chance for some flurries. Not really expecting too much to come on through uh, for Friday. Again, starting off very, very cold in the morning. Our actual temperatures will be close to about 9 below zero in Madison. And then in the afternoon, we have another slight chance for flurries for us coming in later in the day. This is a broader look at what we are expecting to come through on Sunday. Our next system pushing snowfall in late in the day on Sunday. Uh, later in the afternoon, we may start to see some flurries from La Crosse down through Grant County in the western side of the state. Most of it, though, will be coming through overnight and will stay with us throughout the day on Monday. And we may see some periods of very heavy snowfall and the threat for us again looking to the south. That freezing line gets very close to the state line and we would like for that line to stay as far south as possible. That's how we'll keep roads just a little cleaner and the cleanup just a little easier for us. Roads weren't too bad for us today. Looking at our future track into Monday night, the snow is almost entirely to the east and we'll get a little bit of a clearing pattern for us. So here are some preliminary estimates of what we're looking at by Tuesday morning. Close to eight inches in Madison with our GFS. The Euro, though, bringing in over 11 inches for us. So we are expecting several inches of accumulation with the system coming through on Monday. So heavy snowfall at times possible. And with that accumulation on top of what we've already collected, 
Of course, we have had an alert day to the forecast. Overnight will fall close to about 4 degrees for overnight lows. Tomorrow will be close to 16 with a slight chance for flurries, especially in the afternoon. It's going to be very cold outside and just a little windy. Those alert days in the forecast are Friday, Saturday and Monday for the cold on Friday and Saturday and then the snow that will be coming in for Monday. Again, we'll be in the teens for Sunday and Monday and then we drop right again as we get to the middle of next week. I mentioned the roads as we take a look at our first alert traffic update. Uh, we have a look at the Beltline at Broadway. Right now, things actually seem to look okay. May see a few brake lights, uh, but overall a lot of green for us on the major intersections. 3990 seems okay through Dane County. Also the Beltline looking down towards Janesville and up into Jefferson County. Also seeing just a lot of green for us currently. No accidents to report, which is always good news. Downtown seems uh, a little congested, but that's just the usual uh, congestion that we see around this time. 26 minutes from Janesville to the Beltline, 16 for some Middleton to Sox City, and 17 minutes for your drive from downtown to Sun Prairie. So overall, the roads and your drive times look okay. Again, when it comes to my corner of the world for your forecast, it's just going to be very cold for Friday and Saturday. All right, thanks, Dana. Thanks, Dana. Headed five out doctors in Philadelphia separated can join twins. They'll reveal details on the techniques used during the surgery. Separating conjoined twins at the head is an especially complex operation. Today, doctors in Philadelphia are revealing the details on the techniques that helped separate two young sisters from North Carolina. Meg Oliver reports. What's this? 
Aaron and Abby Delaney's parents are grateful their twin daughters are thriving. They are just growing and changing and they're just amazing little people. And I can say that they're really my heroes for what they've been through. The sisters were born joined at the head and even more rare, totally fused with their connection deep into the brain tissue. In June 2017, the conjoined twins were fully separated at 10 months old at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Around three months of age, we separated the bone that was connecting the two twins. And then we sort of slowly pushed them apart and changed the anatomy of where the two were connected. And then that allowed us to do the separation. A new report in the New England Journal of Medicine details how doctors used innovative technology and teamwork to perform the complex separation surgery. A computer navigation system helped them map the connected blood vessels that needed to be divided between the twins. The most difficult part for these girls were they shared some really important big blood vessels and sort of having to be able to separate those and have the brain kind of recover after we did the separation was really the hardest part. Some of the stuff they were doing had never been done before so we didn't know how it was going to work out but luckily everything turned out incredible. We have miracle little girls to show for it. Happy now two years old, Aaron and Abby are receiving many therapies, including physical, occupational, and speech. In the next few years, the sisters will need additional surgery to close the openings in their skulls. Meg Oliver, CBS News. The girls are among the youngest twins joined at the head to ever be successfully separated. And stay with us. We'll have another check of your forecast in just a moment. Here's a look at some of the stories we are working on tonight. The latest from Florida on the attempted bank robbery that has left at least five dead. 
Speaker Pelosi says the president's State of the Union is off until the government is reopened and how the government shutdown could affect your tax refund. Tonight on the CBS Evening News. And after the snow comes the cold. Yes, and it's settling in for us. So right now we're sitting close to 20. It's not too bitter outside, but we are going to drop quite a bit for your Thursday plan on temperatures only getting to the teens. And then for our overnight lows for Friday and Saturday, we will drop well below zero with our wind chills anywhere from 20 to 35 below zero for both days. That's why we have alert days in the forecast for Friday and Saturday. Another round of snow is expected to come in for us late Sunday and Monday and bring several inches of accumulation throughout the day on Monday. So we are just going to add on top of the nice little blanket that we already have currently. Right, we'll have more updates on News 3 at 6 and 30 minutes. The CBS Evening News is next.